glancing at the camera and then glancing over to see all of you. Um, so I hope that's not distracting. And uh, the meeting is now in session. The first thing I need to do, this is a little, obviously a little bit different for us. We haven't gone through this virtual meeting process. So I ask everyone to please be patient. Uh, the first thing I need to do for the purposes of compliance with the right to know law is read a rather lengthy statement, which reads as follows. As chair of the Zoning Board of Adjustment, I find that the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We're utilizing GoToMeeting for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen, and if necessary, participate in this meeting through dialing the following number, 1-866-899-4679 and password 780-960-3000. Or by clicking on the following website address, uh, https colon forward slash forward slash global dot go to meeting dot com forward slash join forward slash seven eight zero nine six zero three five seven. This meeting is also. Uh, will also be aired, it is also being aired on New Market Channel 13 for those wishing to watch on TV and streaming at www.newmarketnh.gov channel-13. Providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. Instructions have been provided on the town's website uh, at uh, www.newmarketnh.gov forward slash uh, zoning board of adjustment. If anybody has a problem, please call 603-659-3617, extension 1321, or email at channel13 at newmarketnh.gov. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And I can see that we have a quorum of the board and I believe we have in fact the entire board here in attendance at the moment. Mr. Daigle, Mr. Rosa, Mr. Wayne here, yes he is, there he is. Mr. Mignatelli, Mr. Drago, Mr. Crowley and Mr. Sack, very good. Uh, it, it's also important and required by the Road to Know Law, if anybody has anyone else present in the room with them, if they could uh, provide that information, that would be, that is required and would be very helpful. Is, it, is everyone alone in their respective rooms at the moment? Yep. I'm seeing heads nodding. Thank you. Okay, so our first order of business as always, and uh, I know it's odd under the circumstances, is the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you wouldn't mind. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One and nation. One nation. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Thank you. I had the advantage of having a flag right outside my window here in Manchester. Okay. Next order of business is the uh, approve the review of the minutes of the January 6, 2020 meeting. Uh, I was not in attendance. Does anybody have any comments on the January 6, 2020 minutes? minutes? I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented January 6, 2020. Six. 
You folks Hello. hear me? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve. It's Bob Daigle. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Bob. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Wayne. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And I abstain due to my absence from that meeting. Next order of business is the Chris? Uh, review and approval. Yes, Diane. I think we, um, with all due respect, I just wanted to let you know you're spo supposed to have a roll call vote for every vote that's taken by the board. So it's okay. clear to the public and viewing public. Thank you very much. So oh, that's, thank you for that. As you, as I say, this is different for us. So going back to the January 6, 2020 uh, minutes, uh, Bob Daigle. Aye. Say, Steve Mignatelli. Aye. James Drago. Hi. Wayne Rosa. Hi. I don't think I have, I don't think I need the alternates to vote. Do I, Dan? I don't believe so. Uh, we have five members voting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm abstaining because I was okay. absent from the meeting. That's fine. But four to five is sufficient. Correct. Thank you for that reminder. So moving on to the review and approval of the January 13th, 2020 minutes. Any comments, changes with respect to those minutes? Bob Daigle, I move we accept as presented. I second. Thank you, Wayne. Chris, the only hey, uh, uh, this is Steve Minutelli, Chris. The only thing is in the upper left hand corner of these minutes, it it the date is incorrect. It reflects January sixth. So that, that needs that's just an editorial change that needs to be made by whoever types these up. Okay. I consider that a friendly amendment. Yeah. Further changes, suggestions, revisions to the January 13th, 2020 minutes. Okay, uh, Wayne Rosa. Aye. Steve Mignatelli. Aye. James Drago. Aye. And uh, Connor, I think, was appointed to that meeting. So, Connor Crowley. Aye. And I vote aye. That's unanimous, so I won't ask for nays. And Mr. Daigle was excused and abstains. Correct, Bob? Correct. Okay. So the January 13th minutes are approved, subject to the minor corrections proposed by Steve Mignatelli. Okay. The next order of business is the application uh, for an appeal from administrative decision Reference section 32-10 of the new market zoning ordinance requested by Caitlin Ferretti, 90 Main LLC, regarding the change of use of the first floor from a tattoo parlor to a cat cafe. First floor will be divided into two parts, a cafe side with food prep, kitchen, bathroom, and some seating. And the other section will be a relaxed lounge space with seating and a few adoptable cats from Cattails Rescue. The proposed use, specifically the boarding and adoption of rescue animals, was determined by the town to be not allowed by right in the M2 zone. It does not fit within the current definitions and permitted uses. The property is located at 90 Main Street, tax map U2, lot 31, and the M2 zone. And uh, what we typically do, uh, Ms. Freddie, are you going to be speaking or is your attorney going to be speaking on your behalf? Um, if you will allow it, we would both be happy to speak with you. That's fine. Um, I just want to explain to you and your attorney the way we do things in Newmarket, which is going to give you an opportunity. We've read all of your materials, so please don't read your materials back to us. Uh, just a waste of your time. But this is your opportunity to, uh, to make your case why uh, you are entitled to prevail on your appeal. Uh, we will hear you out patiently. I will open the floor for public comment. Depending on what the public comment is, give you an opportunity to respond if you if you want to, um, to whatever comes up in public comment. Then we'll close the public comment portion of the, of the meeting, and then the board will have an opportunity to ask questions. Does that all make sense? Sounds great. Yes. Okay, so please go ahead. 
Sure, sure. I'm uh, Angela Hayden. I am counsel for uh, the Tipsy Tabby and Ms. Freddie, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. This is definitely a different experience doing it this way. So uh, um, I've appeared uh, not before Newmarket before, but before some other zoning boards. And uh, I think it's great that technology makes it so we can all all see and connect with each other this way uh, under what we're, we're dealing with these days. Um, and I appreciate your sharing that you've all had an opportunity to read our material. So I definitely will not um, read that or provide an in-depth recitation. Um, one, one thing that I did want to address that I, I don't think I did in our written submission is um, it, it's it's really important to distinguish what's going to be happening with the tipsy tabby on the cat side. I don't think there's any question about um, the operation of the restaurant portion of it. And I think the, the open question is what is the, the cat side? Um, the regulations that relate to cat rescue are uh, quite voluminous. They require certain veterinary uh, oversight, health certificates, vaccinations, um, cat rescues or any animal rescue really is going to vet families and potential adopters of those animals. Uh, and that function actually is going to be uh, very much staying with Cattails Rescue. And that's why um, Ms. Ferretti partnered with a cat rescue for this. And, and this is a pretty common uh, way that cat cafes around the country have structured their, their business and the way that they do things is they keep it separate. So while the Tipsy Tabby isn't going to be operating as a cat rescue, they are going to provide the opportunity for people to connect with adoptable animals. Um, you know, very much similar to going to a, a pet co on a Saturday morning um, or at some other event along those lines. But the, uh, the primary responsi responsibility for actually um, meeting the regulations and following the, the cat adoption, cat rescue requirements will be firmly in the hands of cattails. So um, I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, and like I said, this is a pretty common way that other cat cafes have structured their businesses and it's still a very developing industry. Um, I think it's actually very exciting that the first one in New Hampshire could be a new market as I'm in the process of moving my own office from Exeter up to Newmarket. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I can speak personally that uh, I've had several people who have become aware of my involvement in this project and are very excited to see something like this come to New Hampshire. Um, I would like to give uh, my client an opportunity to speak because her enthusiasm absolutely eclipses mine, uh, and I, I think it's uh, worth sharing that. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Caitlin Ferretti, obviously. Um, probably a lot of you on the board don't know me yet because I'm new to town. Um, I am a New Hampshire native. I grew up in Pittsfield, but um, the past five years I've lived in Georgia. And um, I worked at a veterinary hospital down in Georgia. And, you know, I was in charge of anesthesia. We were a dentistry practice every day with surgeries, you know, two to five surgeries a day. And it was very rewarding work, but I always enjoyed my volunteering at a rescue organization down there more. You could just listen to it because I'm going to. And, um, Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to. You got to show a little bit here. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Just a moment. Somebody has some noise going on in the background. Can you please mute your mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Thank you, Miss Freddie. Apologies for that. Please carry on. Oh, it's okay. I know this. I've done a couple of these the past couple months, and it's always an adventure. Um. But anyways, working down in Georgia and volunteering, I was enjoying myself immensely. Um, I did miss home and on my birthday, my husband, uh, John, he brought me to Java Cats, which was a new cat cafe that had opened in Marietta. And when we got there, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, Everybody in there had a smile on their face, a hot drink in their hand, and a potential, you know, new family member sitting in their lap. And um, it was just a great way to mix my passion for animals with my joy of being with the public. 
as an anesthesiologist at a vet practice, I didn't see any people all day. Um, so anyways, an opportunity came that we could come home to New Hampshire, which we couldn't say no to. And we landed here in Newmarket. Um, it happened that we liked the property that we were purchasing, but um, finding this <laughs> vibrant town was just a bonus. And um, we've grown to really love our new hometown. So I had initially thought of Portsmouth first um, for this uh, new business venture, but I just, I can't say no to new market. And um, being on the bus line to the college students who will love to, to see the cats, they don't have cats in their dorms. So um, an opportunity for them to, to have that experience. I just, Newmarket was just perfect. And I really appreciate you guys all give me the opportunity to talk to you and explain what my plans might be and um, give you an overview of what a cat cafe is. Thank you so much for reading the materials. Um, and that's really all I have to say is I just, I really appreciate the opportunity and um, I hope I can make you all proud of Newmarket <laughs> even more so than you must be already. Can I just ask quickly, uh, who's responsible for the cats on, on your site? Cat Tails Rescue uh, will be in charge of all of their medical needs and all of their adoption needs. Um, I will have staff on site that will make sure that the cats are safe and the interactions with the customers are safe with the cats. Um, and Cat Tales has a lot of volunteers that are excited to be a part of this and to come and check in um, on a probably daily basis. And they'll do all the transportation um, for the cats. And was there any particular aspect of the cat's care that you were concerned about that I could address? No, uh, I just was curious who between uh, your staff, yourself, and the, uh, the adoption agency was actually responsible for the cats when they were in your building. Right. Um, I guess it'll be a team effort, um, but they'll be well cared for and the Department of Agriculture will determine how many cats we'll be allowed to have. Okay. Uh, Attorney Hardy, I don't know if you're still there. Not Attorney Hardy, excuse me. <laughs> Hayden, I am here. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, Hayden. Um, so which 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 definitions are? I, I saw in your materials you were looking at the definition of service. Correct. Is that because That's, you? Yeah, I'm sorry. Ahead. If I can just finish, does yeah. that mean that you feel like the use already meets the definition of restaurant? Yes. And I, and I okay. believe that the denial actually acknowledged that the restaurant definition was met. The concern was about um, the characterization of the cat side of the business. And it, and it was, um, I believe the denial uh, referenced it as a cat rescue. And so okay. I think that distinction is important that the cat rescue is, it, the, the rescue has a different function and different requirements. And this is more along the lines of a service in the sense that they're right. providing that opportunity for adoptable animals who, who can tolerate the environment. That's a really important part of this too, is that not every cat's going to be um, a good fit for this environment. And I, I think that Cattails is very uh, cognizant of that. And I, I know uh, Ms. Freddie is certainly very cognizant of that as well. Um, but this is really more about creating an opportunity for those cats to meet the public, just like I said, kind of like a, a pet co-adoption event. Um, as well as there are, Ms. Freddie's addressed this uh, in her written submission previously, there are lots of um, benefits, uh, social benefits and psychological benefits of being able to be around cats. And um, I think even more so these days, if, if kids do get to come back on campus, uh, there's a lot of value in animal therapy. So um, it can kind of create that, that opportunity and fill that space as well. Okay. So yes, so we believe it falls into the definition of, of service. Okay. Any comments? At this, at this point, I'm going to uh, open the meeting for public comment. So if there's any member of the public, please turn on your microphone, state your name and your address, and 
whatever comment you care to make, we're happy to hear it. Work. Where's the... Chris? Yes, ma'am. Hello? 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 Hi. My name is Kate McPartland. Um, I live at 55 Main Street. I'm actually right across the street. I definitely can see, so I already own cats and um, I heard about this project and I was kind of excited to go in just as a cafe and we totally viewed it as a service as far as just wanting to go in and stop by and, you know, get tea and hang out with cats. So, yeah, just wanted to voice that that was something my, everyone living in my apartment was looking forward to. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the public yeah. care to comment? Hey guys, this is Jessica Goodrow. I live at 26H Piscassic Street in Newmarket. Um, I get a word since she's slow. You know what I mean? If someone has their microphone, if people had their microphones on, just turn them off for a second while, while we hear from Ms. Goodrow and then we'll circle back to you. Ms. Goodrow, please go ahead. Heck Thank you. Um, I live here in Newmarket, and um, I just think a cat cafe would be so great and so valuable, um, a very great addition to to our small downtown area. And I'm a personal, personally a huge cat lover. A lot of my friends I've told this this idea to, and they absolutely love it, and they definitely want to come visit and, and experience it themselves. And so I think it'd be a really great, not only a draw to Newmarket, but um, just really helpful on the individual level. So I'm definitely, definitely for it. Thank you. Anyone else? Care, care, uh, Catherine Steer. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Catherine Steer. I live at 8A Bay Road. Uh, also a huge supporter of this as a, as a concept. And uh, I will also repeat that when I posted on uh, my Facebook page that uh, we might get, be getting a cat cafe, I had several people uh, from as far away uh, as my friends in Nashua and also in Northern New Hampshire say, we will definitely be coming to visit New Market now um, and, and just, just to visit that. So I, I, I do think it would be a draw for out-of-towners to bring them into our town as well. Thank you. Joshua mm -hmm. and Kayla Raymond. Hi there. Uh, my name's Hi. Joshua. I live at 417 Hanson's Ridge Road. I live in Springvale, Maine. Uh, I've been friends with the Ferretti's for probably about a decade and uh, just being from southern Maine, uh, even news about the Tipsy Tavi uh, has spread to even here and a lot of people are really excited and are absolutely willing to travel out to Newmarket not only for the Tipsy Tabby, but for any other business down there. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other member of the public care to comment? Um, hello? 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 Hello, yes. Hi. Please, please um, state your name and address. <laughs> my name is Carly Anderson, and I live at 65 Princeton Drive in Hooksett, New Hampshire. Um, I am very excited about the possibility of a cat cafe coming. Um, my fiance and I are constantly looking for places to go that aren't, you know, huge corporations to travel New Hampshire and find some place to, you know, go settle down, sit enjoy the state of New Hampshire and being animal lovers and again animal therapy and being around cats and you know a little cafe that's not a huge corporation like Starbucks and being able to explore a town like Newmarket being able to be up there um, would just be amazing and I've shared the post through Facebook and everywhere and being in Hooksit, I work in Salem, New Hampshire. I've had people share it all around Salem, and I have people from northern Massachusetts all ready to 
be so excited to head up to Newmarket, and it would just be such sure. a great experience to be able to go see. Thank you. Is that? Where is that, though? Where's what? Never mind, uh, Carly. It's Diane is our town planner is neglecting to mute her microphone. She's on a separate phone call. Uh, Hang on. We're generally pretty semi-formal here. Uh, I would prefer if there are people who are not from Newmarket to hold your comments for a minute. Are there any members of the public from Newmarket who would like to comment on the uh, on the application who have not already done so? Okay. Anyone else not from Newmarket care to comment very briefly on the application? I see Ben Small has a microphone activated. Is Ben Small there? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yep, my name is Ben Small. I'm from 3425 Ebenezer Farm Road in Marietta, Georgia. I just wanted to say I've known this couple for a long time. They're a very ambitious young couple who uh, always go above and beyond and accomplish the goals that they set. Uh, I definitely see this business being something that'll that'll thrive, and I can see that these two are going to do an amazing job. I've seen them do some amazing things that I haven't seen other people do, and I just want to say that I support them. Thank you very much, Mr. Small. Any further comment from the public? Could I add one more comment, actually, about Ms. Freddy, which I think uh, I think she neglected to share in her uh, in her own intro. Uh, she does come for from. Just, sorry for just for a second. This is Attorney yeah. Hayden speaking. It is. I'm sorry. My apologies. Yes. Yeah. Um, she Ms. Uh, Ms. Freddy's father is uh, very involved in local government where uh, the town where she grew up and. Uh, you know, I think since so many people have had great things to say about them, I would very much see both of these two becoming uh, very deeply entrenched in um, the town and being of great service to the town, just based on my short time that I've had to get to know them. Uh, just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any further, any further comment from the public on the application? Seeing none, I'm going to close the uh, public comment portion of the hearing and open the hearing for questions, uh, comments by the board. Any member of the board care to comment on the application? Have any questions for the applicant or uh, her attorney? Chris, Bob Daigle here. Um, I'm just wondering why they selected to call this a service. I looked down through the accepted uses and you know, they could have called it an educational facility or a few other things like that. What was the thought process behind sticking with just a service? Sure, I can address that. Um, we felt based upon um, our conversations uh, with um, and our review of the possible uh, options that that seemed to be the most fitting for uh, the way that we perceive the what's happening with the cat side of the business. Um, but you, you certainly have a point. It could be uh, something that would fall into the educational space. But I, I think where uh, the objective is really to allow these cats who are adoptable animals to have the interaction with the public and hopefully be adopted, that felt like uh, the better fit. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to speak, if I may. Diane Hardy. Diane, if you'll hold on for just a second, I will let you speak. Let me let me see if there's any other board member who wants to speak first, if you don't mind. Any other board member uh, care to comment or have any questions for the applicant? Okay, Diane, please. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, in my capacity with the town, I'm the zoning administrator. And one of my functions is to interpret, administer, and enforce the zoning ordinance. And I work hand in hand with Mike Hoffman, who's our code enforcement officer. Um, any decisions that we make, administrative decisions, um, are appealable to the ZBA pursuant to the state RSAs. And this application is before us under that provision of the state RSA. 
I wanted to just kind of give everyone an overview of the zoning. You wanted to know, I believe someone asked, well, what's the basis for this? Was it considered a service? Was it considered restaurant retail? And since I'm the one that made the decision, I'd like to have the opportunity to speak uh, because I worked very closely with the building official, the code enforcement officer in viewing this. I also consulted with our town legal counsel, John Radigan. Um, I just want to give you a overview that this is located in the M2 zoning district and the M2 zoning district is our downtown zoning district, which provides for a variety of uses um, that are typically found in a downtown. And uh, this is the first time I've been here for 14 years. This is the first time that we have ever had a request for um, an administrative decision from a uh, staff uh, decision that was made. And I wanted to just give you an overview um, that we do have in our zoning ordinance, a table of permitted uses, and it includes a variety of uses in this mixed use zone, residential, commercial. Um, and if you go down the list, which is in table 3256, there's a whole array of uses that are allowed, including mm -hmm. retail including services, including offices, restaurants. Um, it's probably the broadest zoning classification that we have in the town zoning ordinance. When this first came in, uh, Ms. Ferrari um, approached us and um, I was very cautious in reviewing this use and not so much that, um, that, that the uses themselves, in, in, they were not uh, appropriate, but more so that this is a combination of two uses. This isn't just a restaurant. This isn't just a, um, a cat shelter or a rescue uh, shelter or a boarding facility. It's a combination of two. So that immediately uh, raised red flags to me. And um, I recognize that this is a very new idea here in New Hampshire. And I applaud um, the applicant for her um, ability to come forward with a very feasible proposal and moving this forward. And I just want to be, you know, make sure that it's understood that because it's so unique and unusual, this is the first one in the state of New Hampshire. The first one um, in the region, I believe was in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, it might've been a case that went before the city of Boston um, in their zoning uh, department. And they went through a extensive ZBA process to get approval for that particular um, application. And I understand that other countries like Japan and Europe have tried this idea and it's worked out really great. There's a few handful, I guess, here in the United States. Um, I guess I looked at it in terms of the combined use that there are some uh, particular impacts associated with this that shouldn't be overlooked, public health and safety aspects. And I did learn very quickly on that this is something that is licensed by the State Department of Health and Human Services and the State Department of Agriculture. And since my first meeting with Katie, um, she's come a long way in um, putting together some very extensive information. She's done her homework and her research, and she has tried very hard to address many of the issues that uh, had come up in our initial discussions. Um, so I initially I was very skeptical about it and because it's so unique and unusual for new market I did consult with John Radigan our legal counsel and we sat down together and we reviewed the uses and it has always been my interpretation as a zoning officer if a specific use is not listed in the table of permitted uses that it's not an allowed use in that zone. I didn't see anything in there about animal shelters or um, boarding facilities for animals, and nor did I see anything that combined those use. So given that, um, I was advised by legal counsel to um, take a very um, um, a conservative um, approach to this. And since it's so new and unusual that really this is something that perhaps the zoning board through their powers and their authority can review, provide the opportunity for public comment. And as I say, there's been a lot of information provided um, to date that uh, really do support what um, the applicant's proposing to do. I just thought in all fairness as the zoning administrator, I should have the opportunity to explain our justification and rationale for the denial, which was both uh, a joint decision between Mike Hoffman and myself. Thank you. 
I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of the board members have. Okay. Uh, any members of the board have any comments or questions arising from Diane's comments? I will say for seeing none, I will say for my part um, that I think it's entirely appropriate for this to come before the board. I don't, I think that the denial at the initial stage is very appropriate and it's very appropriate when we're in these unusual situations uh, for the public to have an opportunity to comment and it's very helpful. So I appreciate the position that, that, that uh, our zoning officials were in. But it's ultimately up to the CBA to determine whether or not the use that's proposed, uh, either as is or subject to some kind of reasonable conditions, is sufficiently consistent with the definitions of things in the ordinance and can be managed in a way that's consistent with public health, safety, and welfare, uh, that it'll meet the uh, language, spirit, and intent of the ordinance. I think the ZBA, my opinion, this is just my personal opinion, has no desire to stifle people who want to be creative, who want to be entrepreneurial and look at things differently, uh, provided we can have some reasonable assurance that there's, again, public health, safety, and welfare are, uh, are being protected and the language of the zoning ordinance is being honored uh, in its, both in its letter and in its spirit. Um, I respect whatever. Strongly, can I make one more comment? Just that I respect uh, the board's position on this and that's why it's before you because there was a lot of ambiguity in this use and whether or not it met the criteria that's in our ordinance. Um, I do say that if the board decides tonight to approve this, that I would like to make sure that there are conditions placed on the approval, that um, it, uh, that there is close adherence to any requirements of the Department of Health and Human Services and also the Department of um, Agriculture. Uh, we do have some correspondence from the State Health Department that there needs to be a food service application provided and um, that these permits be issued prior to any certificate of occupancy for the both, both of those uses. So that would be my recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dan. We're thinking along the same lines. So, um, may, may, would this be in a, would I be able to comment just uh, briefly? Absolutely. Sure. And uh, Ms. Hardy and I, I absolutely appreciate uh, your position. I wanted to, uh, to start with that. And, and I absolutely agree when you have something completely novel like this. Um, you know, as, as much as I know, Ms. Freddie, you know, who, who knows who would be out there trying to do something that, um, something novel and unique and new that uh, may not be quite as conscientious as, uh, as I, I feel Ms. Freddy has been. So um, I do want to uh, clarify as well that, that we absolutely agree that um, the, the health aspect as well as the animal safety aspect are both things that uh, Ms. Freddy has considered and is acting in a way that's extremely conscientious of that. Um, I think she said earlier that um, she's, she's already looked into or even addressed uh, some of the, the ag uh, questions that will arise and certainly uh, FDA regulations uh, apply here and um, it's extremely important to keep the cat area separate from uh, the food service area and, and one of the important aspects of that is ensuring that um, there will be no um, reusable food service items permitted in the cafe. It will be just like you're taking your, your food to go. Uh, so she will be using biodegradable single use uh, service items that will be taken into the cafe. No reusable things will be going in there at all. So um, I did certainly we are absolutely um, on board with those restrictions being in place and, and she certainly intends to uh, work through the appropriate channels to uh, make sure that all of those requirements are being met. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, any, Bob, did you want to comment? Uh, just, uh, uh, I believe in reading through the material that you have a business plan in place and it's been reviewed by some financial institution and they're on board, they feel it's a viable plan and they're gonna back you. Yes, uh, thank you, Bob. Um, so I have 
a loan from primary bank and through the SBA. The SBA is waiting on certificate of occupancy um, to, to fully fund, but they supported my business plan and allowed us to purchase the building um, for this business. And that was primary bank and the SBA and the Regional Economic Development Center. They also provided a loan for the renovations to restore the building um, and make it safe because there were some uh, major not safe aspects in the structure of the building. So we've uh, already uh, repaired those problems uh, with the Regional Economic Development Center's help. Thank you. Thank I, you I remember going through the, the renovation part you were before us before, so thank you. Yes, absolutely. You're welcome. Any further comment from the board? At this point, I'm going to propose that we, I don't know what's the right terminology, grant the appeal, permit the use, uh, subject to the condition that the applicant com will comply with all applicable state and federal regulations, including without limitation, Health and Human Services, Department of Agriculture, FDA, and whatever else may be out there that apply. Uh, that gives us, I understand that you're already legal obli legally obligated to comply with the law, but uh, I think it's important that the public understand that this is a condition, as far as the DBA is concerned, this is a condition of your use of the property. Uh, we, got, we are concerned with public health and safety uh, and the health, health and safety of the cats as well. I have three at home myself. And my experience is that cat people tend to police themselves and others. Um, but I think it's important that we make that as, a, as an express condition of the grant of the appeal, I guess is the right terminology. So, so Chris, just to clarify, you're, you're making the motion with uh, the conditions that Diane has attached to it or would like to see attached to it? Yes, I'm, I'm stating it just more broadly that yep. uh, I would move to grant the appeal and permit the use uh, on the express condition that the uh, applicant will comply with all applicable uh, state and federal law and local ordinances, including without limitation, any requirements of the Department of Health and Health and Human Services, the Department of Agriculture, and the uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as I understand it, and any other regulations that I can't think of that may apply. I'll, I'll be glad to second that. Any further comment or discussion? Okay, Wayne Rosa. I vote aye. Steve Mignatelli. Aye. Bob Daigle. Aye. James Drago? Aye. And I vote aye as well. The ayes have it. Thank you and good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome and good luck. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next item of business is the uh, public hearing for an application for a variance, reference sections 32-56 of the new market zoning ordinance requested by North Point Realty Inc. to permit the construction of a duplex in the R2 zone where duplexes are not permitted. The existing house and outbuildings will be demolished. The property is located at 258 Wildly Falls Road, tax map U4, lot 68 in the R2 zone. And Mr. Phoenix, Attorney yeah. Phoenix is here, and Mr. Rabenius. Good evening. Good uh, evening. You've heard basically. You've heard basically how we how we try to do things. Uh, Going to give you give you an opportunity to present whatever additional information you like to present. Uh, please uh, assume that we have read your materials carefully, so you don't need to read it to us. But this is your opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say in support of your application. Then we'll go to public comment open that, close that, and move on to comments from the board. We will give you an opportunity to respond to public comment uh, if you choose to do so. So Attorney Phoenix. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'm Tim Phoenix, an attorney from Hopeful Phoenix, Cormley and Roberts in Portsmouth. I'm here tonight on behalf of North Point Realty. Paul Rabinius is here. He's the uh, principal. Also with us on the screen is Brenda Colbo from uh, uh, TF Moran. Uh, they've done the technical work, the plans. Uh, full disclosure, I have with me another lawyer from my firm, uh, Monica Kaiser. Um, she's not going to present, but she's going to help me if I mess up the uh, share screen because I'm a novice. This is my first time at that. Um, and it goes smoother if I start making mistakes. Um, I'm going to try, I'm going to share the screen right off if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please go ahead. If I can figure out, I think I need to. Okay. Monica just applauded me because I apparently did that right. There so, um, this is the plan. Um, I've only got a couple of things to show you. Uh, what we have is 258 uh, Wadley Falls Road or Route 152. It's a very large parcel. It's, it's uh, over five acres, just a little over five acres, and it's along the shore of the Piscassic River. Um, as you can see here, um, on the lot uh, is a, a home and a number of outbuildings that are uh, in pretty poor condition. You can see here that um, these buildings actually are, appear to be over the uh, front lot line. These are right on the lot line. This is very close to, if not over, the sideline. And uh, it's a little hard to see here, but you can see these various lines that uh, are the setbacks here and here and the state line back here, um, uh, which are the required, uh, if you will, wetland buffers from the Piscassic uh, River. So the, the zone allows uh, half acre lots. So we've got a lot that's 10 times the size that's necessary for a lot, um, a house lot in this zone. So Paul originally looked at uh, subdividing the lot to make two lots and put a house, a house on each of two and a half acres. Um, and, but as you can see, the lot is significantly constrained uh, by these uh, wetland uh, and related buffers. So uh, after doing an analysis, um, he felt, and, and I agreed when I got involved, that two homes on this very large lot where two homes would be allowed on an acre seemed reasonable. So it was either go with a conventional subdivision, uh, you know, cut the lot in half, let's say, and put a house here and another one over here. Um, but the house that's over on this side would end up having um, uh, to get um, di di uh, dimensional relief for the wetland setback. So given the, the nature of that particular area, the fact that it's, it's a kind of a transition zone between um, R1, 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 which is over here, um, which is less dense than uh, the municipal zone, um, M3, which is over here, which is more dense. Um, it seemed reasonable to put a duplex, uh, which uh, what requires uh, relief because duplexes are not allowed, uh, but also allows us to avoid um, requesting dimensional relief. And we thought that um, having the duplex that uh, is outside of any wetland buffers is better for the environment and would not uh, be problematic because of the location. So I'm going to try to bring up another one here. Whoops. Yeah. So this is a set of the photographs we took, and you can see the red arrow here. This is 258 uh, Wadley Falls Road, and you can see that it's uh, a largely undeveloped area. So you'd have a duplex, you know, roughly in here that is um, uh, not uh, crowded. It's not out of place with the area. Uh, you can see that there are some uh, denser um, uh, communities over here. There's what I believe is an apartment building here. The elementary school is here. There's a senior uh, facility uh, over here, and that may actually be in the R R3 zone. I'm not positive. Uh, and here's the river going through. And then we've got the denser downtown uh, area uh, with other schools and dense uh, uh, home uh, areas over here. And so here, I'm just going to show you some photographs. This is the main house. So as you're facing the lot, it's to the right. You can see the outbuildings behind it. Um, this is uh, down the street and you can see on the left, that's the, the garage structure, um, very close to the road. 
pretty poor condition, um, very close to the lot line in the house that's next door. Um, uh, there's it from the backside. Um, so the idea is to clean all of that up uh, and put the duplex on, which is shown on the plan. Um, let's go back to that. Um, so here's the uh, proposed plan with the duplex. Um, and you can see everything's been taken out over here. So we're cleaning up the streetscape, cleaning up the, uh, the uh, buffer, uh, and putting the duplex uh, over here, uh, which is fully compliant with the uh, dimensional requirements. And then just, it wasn't in my packet, but I think it was in um, the one Paul originally submitted. This is uh, uh, what the, the four sides um, of the duplex. So that's the project. I'm going to go back here to uh, I'll just leave it there. So um, as I said, the only variance we need is to have a, a, a duplex on five acres where um, 0.5 acres is required for a home, but it's only single family homes are permitted uh, in the zone. Uh, going into the variance requirements, the first two um, are, I always do together. You've probably heard that before uh, based on some case law that I've cited in my memorandum. And that's that the variances are not contrary to the public interest and the spirit of the ordinance is observed. And the test is whether granting the variance conflicts with the ordinance's basic zoning objectives. Um, as my memorandum um, states, um, we looked at what the, the uh, purpose of the ordinance, which is to guide the character of growth, development and change in order to provide for the public health, safety, and general welfare, balancing the needs of the process of growth, development, and change with the need to preserve and enhance those qualities which make Newmarket a safe and desirable place to live. Um, I then go through a, a number, 10 or so bullet items. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory, and I've explained in my submission how we meet them. I just want to uh, mention a couple of them. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, intents of the uh, of uh, New Market's Zoning Ordinance and Master Plan is to provide for a variety of quality living arrangements with emphasis on quality neighborhoods. So we've got two dwellings on five acres with almost 300 feet of, uh, feet of frontage meeting all coverage requirements. The duplex ownership, uh, which will be uh, on, on this very large lot will allow more moderate um, income buyers to buy who might otherwise not be able to buy in, in a new market, especially new. Um, and the other is the to protect the sense of community and friendly small town atmosphere. Um, this alternate uh, duplex style of living we think does that. And finally, to advance aesthetic values through design and architecture, because the preservation or enhancement of the visual environment may promote prosperity and the general welfare. I hope you would agree that putting up this duplex, which is uh, relatively modest, it's I, I think it's uh, well designed, it's a good looking building. Um, and it's set back uh, off the road. It is certainly um, more visually um, in enhancing of the environment than the existing home uh, and even more so the other outbuildings that are very close to the road. Uh, I don't think those enhance the, uh, the visual environment and certainly not uh, health and safety. This house will be completely two code, uh, which is unlikely um, that the existing one is. So to close out those the first two uh, requirements for the variance is the courts look at, would the variance alter the character of the locality or threaten the public health, safety, or welfare? And certainly the character of the locality, as I showed you in the photograph, um, is somewhat eclectic. Um, the R, R1 zone is nearby, uh, less dense. Um, the, it goes into this zone, which is actually, this zone is a little narrower. It's wider at the top and the bottom. In this area, it's a little bit narrower. So. This lot is pretty close to both the R1 and the municipal zone. And as I showed, it's surrounded by an eclectic uh, mix of other uses, including schools, apartments, senior living facilities, et cetera. So we think that this building uh, fits in with the essential character of the locality. And does, uh, so it does not alter it to the negative and it doesn't threaten the public health, safety or welfare. The third requirement for the variances is that they will not diminish surrounding property values. So again, we've got an existing uh, situation where the existing home is in poor condition. It's very close to the road. The other outbuildings are, 
are over the lot line, very close to the road and in the buffer. Um, so removing those buildings in favor of something that's new, um, tastefully designed and set back um, is gonna enhance the value of this property and thus certainly will not diminish the uh, surrounding property values. The fourth of the five variance requirements is that denial of the variance results in an unnecessary hardship. There's a three prong test, as you know. Uh, the first is that special conditions exist that distinguish the property from others in the area. So we first have a very large lot for the area, 10 times the required size. It's bordered by the Piscassic River, which has fairly healthy uh, setback requirements from it between state and uh, local. Uh, so it's burdened by the wetland, the buffer, um, and building setback violations. Um, so that the application of the setbacks leaves a, a small building uh, envelope for uh, two homes. And again, it was sort of the choice, do we go with a duplex or do we try to get variances from the dimensional requirements? And we thought this was uh, a better choice. Um, all these things together can create special conditions for this lot. The second prong is that no fair and substantial relationship exists between the public purposes of the ordinance and its specific application in this instance. So why do we have use restrictions? It's to make sure that uh, in general, uh, like uses are in like areas. So you have residential uses in one area, industrial in another, commercial and downtown uses in another. Um, but here um, we've got uh, differing kinds of residential uses, apartment buildings, senior living facilities, um, and other uh, uses such as schools, uh, all in a fairly uh, close uh, diameter, or close radius area. So the um, allowing this single duplex on this very, very large lot um, is not going to violate the uh, purpose of uh, the one lot, one house um, portion of the zoning ordinance. Thus, there's no fair and substantial relationship between the public purposes of this zone, which is one house on a half acre lot uh, in its application here. The third prong of the hardship test is that the proposed use is reasonable. Um, it is a residential zone. Um, residences are permitted. Um, it's replacing uh, what could be considered an eyesore kind of a building and outbuildings very close to the lot line. So we believe it's reasonable. And the final uh, of the five requirements is that substantial justice is done by granting the variance. The test is if there's no benefit to the public that would outweigh the hardship to the applicant, this factor is satisfied. Any loss to the applicant not outweighed by a gain to the general public is an injustice. So uh, North Point has the reasonable right to the, to the use and development of its property. And we think it would be fair to North Point to allow in this instance, under these circumstances, uh, this duplex um, where we are protecting the environment better, we are taking buildings that violate setbacks uh, and are probably, are, I'm, guess, I'm sure, are not to code, uh, cleaning up the streetscape, so to speak. So there's no harm to the public given the eclectic area and other uses in the area, uh, but to deny uh, that there would be harm to Mr. Rabinius and his company as they would be then limited to one house on this very large lot where um, I don't think you could put 10, but the, it's 10 times the size of the lot that's necessary. Um, so for all of those reasons, uh, we hope you will agree and grant this single variance so that Paul can proceed. Um, we are all here to answer any questions you may have or address any comments to the public. And now I need to know how to unshare this. You want me to leave it up, Mr. Chairman, or, or take it down? Uh, if you could take it down, because I can't see, you're blocking like three quarters of my screen. So if you could take it down, that'd be great. But don't lose it, because we may want to look at it again. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, I'll uh, open the meeting for public comment. Any member of the public care to comment? I see Liz Doust. Yes. <laughs> um, my name is Liz Doust. I live at 255 Wadley Falls Road. Uh, we lived across the street from Joy and Ed Kimball for uh, 20, it's going on 23 years now, or just about 23 years. Um, <laughs> the the outbuildings that aren't as, as beautiful housed a lot of engineering things. Ed Ed did all the um, HVAC stuff for some of our biggest buildings in town or not in town in Exeter too. He was a World War II vet. He was an amazing guy and he was a mechanic in the um, in the military as well. 
So that's what is in all those outbuildings, which I understand are not as attractive anyway, or it once was what was in there. Uh, we have some concerns uh, living across the street. Um, one of our concerns is uh, looking at why isn't this being considered uh, a single family home lot? Um, it really, when we look at what the benefits are or, or the harm that we're hearing about that could come to Mr. Rabenis, I'm sorry, Rabenit, I want to make sure I say it right, Rabenius. Um, it's Rabenius, that's fine. You're not okay, the first one. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we look at this and say, boy, there's an awful lot of prime wetland uh, on this property because of the Piscassic and, and it mirrors the other side of the Loisel um, conservation area that we put in uh, in town uh, a number of years ago. And I guess we look at it and say, why are we trying to pack more people into this property as opposed to just developing a really nice single family home as it's zoned for uh, that would be less of an impact on our environment um, for sure. Uh, the other question I have is, um, what is to prevent someone from going for a variance to put another house in later? Um, even if you put this through, what what would be there to prevent someone subdividing uh, later? That's an, that's another question I have. Um, I I think there are, you know, you were talking about special conditions for this lot, and there are a lot of uh, special conditions because of how much prime wetland is on there. So we, we look at the plans and, and everything, and I think Nate and, and I, my husband and I, both feel that the planning board has seen lots of things come before them. Oh, zoning board, sorry. The zoning board has seen lots of things come before them, and you've had to monitor the growth of our town. I have confidence you're going to look at this and make the best decision. I really do. Um, we're just asking you to consider what, what would it be if we kept it, you know, the single family home as opposed to trying to fit as many as many people or properties as we can in that space just because it is such a special space along the Piscassic and and on the other side of the conservation area that's it thank you any further public comment anyone at all I can see a number of people who have not spoken you don't have to but if you care to you're welcome to Um, yeah, I'm Olivia Alby, and I live at 262 Wadley Falls, right next door to this lot. Um, and I do agree with Liz, um, with later on, you know, somebody else subdividing it again. Um, we don't per se have a problem with the duplex, my husband, Zachary, and I. Um, and yes, we would love to get rid of the um, dwellings that are right next door to our lot. Um, they're very close and um, the, the metal will clang um, in the wind and stuff like that. So it can be um, scary to our children listening to that. Um, but we do agree, you know, about the subdivision later on, if that question can be addressed. Okay, thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing no further public comment, I'm going to close the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Phoenix, if, 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 yeah, if you oh, want to respond, please go ahead. Thank you. That was what I was going to ask. Uh, well, I, I appreciate uh, Ms. Douse uh, and Ms. Alvey uh, comments. Uh, Ms. Douse, particularly very, very um, thoughtful uh, and respectful. Um, so uh, some of the things she said were exactly what Paul is trying to accomplish here, which is protect the prime wetland and protect the conservation uh, area. Um, and that's why uh, he chose to uh, ask for approval for this duplex rather than a straight, a, a typical subdivision with, um, with one of the homes uh, in or, or partly in uh, the wetland. So we think this accomplishes that. Um, but when you, if you look at the, the size of this lot compared to many lots around it, some of which appear to be fairly close to the river. Um, the, we just think it's uh, fundamentally fair um, to allow this duplex um, when there are a myriad of other uses nearby. It's not like this is a, a road um, uh, which is full of just single family homes. And if it was single family homes on half acre lots, 
um, that there would be uh, more homes on this land, probably a little cul-de-sac or something. Um, but obviously that's not gonna happen because of the, the uh, wetland and the buffer. But we think this is just a fair uh, way to deal with a, a very large lot um, given the circumstances. Um, as for further subdivision, um, and certainly uh, that would have to again come before this board because I don't think anything else could be put on the on the lot um, without a uh, another variance, um, and the the board I suppose could put some kind of stipulation on it. Um, but I think it's highly unlikely that if this is granted that the board would um, be open to uh, having a third house on it wherever it may be. Um, I think Paul is content with two. Um, he wants to build them, sell them to nice families, and that will be that. Paul, I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah, I can comment. I mean, we, we did research to see whether or not it was viable to put two separate buildings on the property. And there is a buildable area that, that we could use and still stay within permittable area. Um, it's just for me and the way that I like to do my construction work is, is that I don't always follow the, the maximum amount that you can put. I um, was more interested in trying to, you know, uh, save the, the continuity of the, the land and try to stay away from anything environmental. I, um, that's just the direction that I like to go in. Uh, what I intended to do there was is after the buildings are removed, which are in, in many areas of it actually falling down, I wanted to be able to bring that back to a natural buffer. That will then just go, grow back to the way that it, it should be uh, anyway, without any of the structures or any of the, and, and there's a lot of material that's there from the old business. All of that would be then removed. Um, so my goal was is just to be able to try to find uh, a nicer way of making the application to the land instead of having to force feed it, let's say, and, and create two separate buildings. Um, you know, financially, it's probably, you know, better if I had two separate buildings, you'd make more money that way. But uh, that really wasn't the intent. That's not the way that we looked at it from the beginning. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Paul. If I can just add one, a couple more things, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'd also point out that um, I showed you the photograph, the uh, renderings of the size of the building, and there's some numbers on it. I mean, this is two buildings with a total um, ground floor uh, air coverage of about 1,600 square feet. You have a lot of you know single-family homes that are going to cover cover uh, that same amount. You know, have a 3,200 or so um, square foot uh, home. So this, in my mind anyway, is a two family, uh, a duplex with two families. That's about the size of a single-family home that could go on a lot. So again, the reasons that Paul stated, we think it's a pretty fair. Uh, trade-off to get the benefit, the benefit of the environmental protection. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open the floor up now for questions, comments by the board. Anybody have any questions or comments on the application? Seeing nobody activate their microphone, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, this application, Diane, can you remind me, when this initially came in, weren't there some issues with the plan? And is this current plan now been corrected and updated and is now accurate? Uh, yes, that is correct, Mr. Hawkins. Um, when this first came in, there were some boundaries drawn on the plan. Um, for prime wetlands and different setbacks and buffers that didn't quite make sense. And I did contact the applicant and um, his engineer and reviewed what those concerns were and they have corrected those. And I did review the most recent submittal and it does uh, uh, reflect the correct setbacks for those various environmental features. Um, okay, that's very, obviously important because we want to start with the right information and then go from there. Correct. So everything, uh, to my knowledge, is correct on the plan at this point. So to me, the, the key question, the central question is, if there was no shoreland protection zone, which is this large ellipse that's running through the middle of the plan, could there be two units on this property? Could there be two, 
two structures built on this property or not? Are you asking me for that? I'll start with you, Diane, and then, and then I'll give uh, Mr. Phoenix and Mr. Rabinius an opportunity to respond to that as well. The plan, there's a very, very small area, um, a buildable land area, if you exclude all the buffers. And um, it's not substantial. It wouldn't build, a, you couldn't put a 2,400 square foot home on that lot, maybe a smaller home, maybe one of these new tiny homes um, might be an option. Um, but another point that I think is important to um, recognize is that currently that property is substandard. It's a non-conforming structure. It's right on the frontage. And um, so there's some benefits to this uh, development uh, proposal as planned, um, that it would get rid of those non-conforming uses, I guess. Um, but with all, you know, it, it's not the most ideal lot uh, for development, the, the lot that would remain. But um, certainly, you know, somebody could in the future, uh, Mr. Dow, Mrs. Dows, rather Ms. Dows, uh, was correct that, you know, I don't think we have the ability to control future uh, zoning variances. If an applicant chooses to uh, file one, um, I think we have a, a responsibility to view it. Doesn't necessarily mean um, it has to be approved, but I don't think we have the opportunity to um, look in the crystal ball and, and predict what might be in the future and prevent that from happening. I know many years ago, we used to approve subdivisions with co comments on plans, no further subdivision. And we were told by legal, we had to take that off because it uh, took away due process rights from the applicants. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. My, my question very simply is, and I'm not sure I got an answer to it, is if there was no shoreline protection zone on this property, could two structures be built on this property in compliance with the ordinance? Mr. Chairman, I'll it give you a stab at that one and maybe Diane wants to comment. Uh, my answer to that is yes. Um, you need, you can, you can have as little as a half an acre for a home and you need a hundred feet of frontage. So we have five acres and uh, 285, if I'm reading this right, feet of frontage. So uh, if you put a line down the middle of it, um, Bar, uh, taking away the, the uh, uh, wetland buffers, uh, you'd have plenty of room to meet all of the uh, setbacks. So yeah, but I, I, my answer is yes. We, we do have local setbacks, so there's overlapping jurisdictions here. So, I mean, to, the 250 foot shoreland zone is a state requirement. It does not, um, and our local requirements are actually more stringent in some cases. So I'm not sure, I'm still not sure what the answer to my question is. Is it, is it a question that can't be answered? I mean, to no, me, that I, is the, to me that, and let me just finish. To me, that is the heart of the, or the hardship issue is that we're asking for a duplex, right? We, we need to get to a duplex somehow, not just any structure. So to me, if, if the issue is, if there was no shoreline protection zone, you could have two structures, then it seems to me that's a, that's a, that's a better hardship case. If the answer is you couldn't have two structures, I, I understand it's fi it's a five acre lot. A tiny fraction of that is actually buildable, you know, because it's in wetland. That's state. That's a state issue. That's not a new market zoning issue. That is not correct. We have we have okay. local we have local zoning that protects wetlands. Twenty five foot buffer for very poorly drained soils. Fifty foot buffer for poor for very poorly drained soils. Right. We're, we're not actually it, disagreeing. But we also have we have restrictions. So when you say if it wasn't for the shoreland protection law, we have local regulations that are more stringent is what I'm saying. So okay. it doesn't matter. OK, it's a lapping jurisdiction. So taking everything into account that you just said. Could you have two two structures on the buildable portion of this lot? Leaving aside so the yes. You could put a tiny house, just like I said earlier, you could put one of these new tiny houses and meet that requirement. But okay. you would have to have detailed site plans drawn up and we'd have to probably have a soil scientist verify that there's not going to be any encroachment to those buffers. So it's not a simple question where you can just say yes or no without having engineering done to review it and to make sure it's a viable concept. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, 
you know, in the, initially we actually did research that, not to the extent of going through, you know, soil analysis, but there was a buildable area that was defined if we were to do a subdivision of the property. And the uh, and yes, yeah, so it certainly would not be a large home that would fit on there, but we would meet the setback requirements for uh, environmental issue, you know, wetlands, et cetera. Um, it would have been a smaller one. It still would have met the uh, setback requirements off the road, et cetera. Um, it was, that was the preliminary idea when we purchased the property was to look at that as a subdividable lot. So uh, the, the definition of what we found really to me just wasn't conducive to that. It, this was a much better application if we could uh, move that part forward. If I don't go that way, we don't get approval. That's probably the direction that we will go for is the subdivision of the land to be able to put two pieces of property of two buildings on it. That'll be the goal. Now, whether we, we get it all done, again, it was preliminary engineering, but it was done by the engineering team in order to try to qualify. And Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know that, that see, I don't know that other than me, I don't know that the, the question you wanted ans answered was has been answered. And I just want to restate it and make sure I understood it. If there were no environmental setback requirements, and this was just a lot that wasn't near any wetlands, you want to know whether you could put two houses on it. Not on a five acre lot. See, so, so I don't, I, I regard a bunch of this lot as being unbuildable, just looking at it. It is. Right? That's there's, correct. Only, there's, only, there's only a portion of it that's actually buildable. So right. looking at the buildable portion of the lot, leaving aside the setback, the environmental setback requirements, could you put two structures on this lot? Okay. Leave. Okay. Because that to me, Attorney Phoenix, is the heart of the hardship issue. Because we need to get to a duplex, right? Not just any structure. So if if it's if it's eligible for two structures, then it seems to me it it's a stronger case for a duplex. Gotcha. If it's if it's well, I I can do one house, but it'd be great for me to have two. That's not really a hardship in my mind. Just to tell you how I kind of analyze it. Bob, did you want to comment? Yeah, I just wanted to maybe phrase it a little bit different, excluding all of the the wetlands buffers and everything, what is the actual buildable area that's left in the parcel? Has somebody, has somebody done that analysis? Brenda, can you? Hi, uh, sorry, uh, Brenda Cobble from TFM. Um, that was, uh, like Paul had said, that, that was our original plan was to uh, do two separate lots on this uh, piece of property. Um, once we got into it and we uh, started placing houses on there, uh, we just decided to go with the duplex route. Um, so if you were to take a look at the plans, you can see uh, to the right-hand side of the proposed duplex, we do have some space. Uh, if you were to put another house there, like a single family house uh, would be smaller than what the duplex is. So we have a little bit of room, we could push that over and then we would put a um, put a new lot line down that pretty much right in between, uh, right in the middle of the frontage and then put another house on the, on the left hand side. So yes, there would be enough room for a house there. I guess the question I'm asking, is there a, is there an acre of land there that's not impacted by some kind of a buffer or offset or, or something like that? I don't have that off the top of my head right now, but I do have my computer up. I can, uh, I can see what it is. Is that what that what you're driving at, Chris? I mean, I think that'd be very helpful because I'm okay. I'm struggling with the I'm struggling with the hardship to get to the to get to the duplex. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. If you just give me a, a couple of minutes, I'll uh, I'll do it on the computer here, and I'll and I'll be back. Sure. We'll just talk quietly among ourselves. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Dan. I just wanted to point out that in the R2 zone, the minimum lot size is a half an acre and a density of two units per acre. And if you, you know, set aside the, the wetlands buffers, you should be able to build another house on that lot. Not necessarily, a, as I said, a huge house, but there is a footprint there. So there, that is what the minimum lot size is, or that's what the density requirement is for an R2 zone. That's exactly what Bob asked. Is, is there an acre of buildable land on this, on this lot 
subject yeah, to subject you don't to the need setbacks. Half an acre. You don't need an acre. You need a half an acre. I wanted to clarify that. You don't need a whole acre. He's asking for two units. So we're looking at a duplex here. So it's to build two houses. He could build two houses. He's asking for a duplex. So basically correct. trying to reduce the impact. That is correct. correct. Uh, members of the board and Mr. Chairman, just keep in mind while Brenda's looking at that is the ordinance doesn't say you have to have a half acre that's not impacted by a buffer. It says you have to have a half acre. Correct. So uh, theoretically, if, if this was laid out differently, you could still have uh, homes on a half acre, all of which except the small building envelope is is buffer. So in other words, answering the question whether there's a half acre of non-impacted land doesn't really get us to the to the two the, to the to the question. I'd also mention that, and I, I admit I have not investigated this, but at least theoretically there's the possibility that the existing buildings uh, known as the garage on these plans um, you know, could potentially be uh, redeveloped as a home without moving. Not positive about that, but um, it's something to consider. And again, you know, our our effort before you folks, and we appreciate the thoroughness of your review, is you know balancing all of the issues. And as Diane said, you know, some of those issues are the location of the existing buildings. So it's not just, uh, in my opinion, respectfully, it's not just you know getting to the duplex. It's getting to the duplex, given that. We're staying out of the buffers, removing older buildings, close in proximity, over the lot line, et cetera. I did Understood. mention something else, Mr. Chairman, for the benefit of the board. In our minimum lot size requirements, we are required by our own local ordinance to exclude any very poorly drained soils from the calculation. So you have to have a half an acre um, of good soil, not poorly drained or very poorly drained soils to meet that requirement. Likewise, for poorly drained soils, only 25% uh, of the lot can be those wetland type soils, and that includes their buffers as well. So it's a little more complicated and, you know, perhaps we should bring this to the planning board and have them review it and see if it's a viable subdivision and if not they can turn it down and they can come back to the the, the zba and uh, we'd have a clearer sense of where they stand hi this is uh, brenda from tfm again um so i got 0.66 acres of buildable land um and that's excluding the yard setbacks and the 100 foot uh, wetland setbacks for the structure setbacks. Right. How much, I'm sorry, 2,500? No, I'm sorry, uh, the figure amount. What was the figure you just mentioned? 0.66 acre. 0.66 acres. And how yep. many square feet? That's 29,110. But she's saying that's excluding the setback, right? Correct. So it's actually more than that. That's this is the point Attorney Phoenix was just making. It's actually more than that. Under, well, yes, under but the, you under, under the way he reads the ordinance. Under the way he reads the ordinance. I thought you were talking about buildable area. Um, yeah. Because we don't consider. Well, I had, didn't consider the um, area within the setbacks to be buildable. Okay. But it still would be countable, as Mr. Chairman just said. It would still be countable as a acreage for the for lot size considerations. Oh yes, yes. That, you're that right. was yeah. That was acknowledging your argument, Attorney Phoenix. I am. That's correct. Okay. Did you exclude so one percent of the very poorly drained soils? Because I'm sorry. Were, did you exclude a hundred percent of the very poorly drained soils in the buffer? Because that cannot be part of the minimum lot size under the town zoning ordinance. Um, 
We did not do soils analysis, but I did not include any area within the wetland buffer at all. So okay. uh, it would not be. Okay. So it, it sounds to me like we do have we do have a viable acre to, to work with over there. Yeah, I would, I'd say so. All right. Uh, any any other questions? And I'm sorry to dominate the discussion. Any other with my comments? Any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, just one thing. I knew Ed fairly well when I first moved into town, and uh, we're an extremely extremely creative individual. Uh, he could work magic in those shops. Uh, he once told me there was nothing he couldn't do. It just cost more money. <laughs> you would believe some of the treasures I found in that that shop that were tucked behind a, a cubby or something that little steam motors that he built by hand. I was just he was definitely an inventive guy. Him, him and Arnold Dennett up on um, that swamp road were were lost treasures. Pretty good stuff. Is there any further uh, comment or question from the board, Wayne? I see your microphone on. Mr. Rosa. Um, I don't think uh, a couple things. I don't think we can consider future subdivision. I, I, I don't think we can really consider that and vote against this because of that. That would, uh, I don't agree with that. The other thing is, is I think and I knew Ed too, so I'm, this is in no way detrimental, but I think we have a, an opportunity here to clean up the place, more or less, for the lack of better words, clean up the place and put something very presentable um, on that lot. That's my comments. Um, I wanted, if I could, Mr. Chairman, that, that's a good point. You know, when the duplex is sold, you know, basically what, you know, the, the land value or the ownership of that land then it becomes the whole property. It's it's not just, you know, the, the, the building footprint. So trying to subdivide that afterwards, I, I don't even think that you could do that. You'd have to, you know, take the ownership of that and then, you know, redistributed by deed and everything else. So I, I don't think that that's something that, that uh, can be done. I mean, Chris, can I, can I make one more yeah, other comment? Can, wait a minute. Well, uh, Wayne, go ahead. Bob, I'll get to you next. Yep. Um, my, my third comment would be um, the attorney brought up the fact that I, I've seen worse done, more done with worse buildings I mean, there's a possibility that there, those buildings could be used somehow and, and renovated for uh, residential, and I don't think that's a good thing. Well, I, I've seen worse <laughs> or more bizarre things. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not, I'm not using that as a threat. I'm just saying there's, there's other possibilities that I, I just think this is a good, a good thing for that lot. At okay. this Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Bob and then James. Yeah, I'm just looking at the proposed layout and I think the, where the building is located, it would make it very difficult to carve out a piece of land behind it subdivide it when we get a roadway in there and things like that. So I think the, the, the layout of the duplex itself precludes to some extent subdivision in the future. Thank you. James? Completely off topic, but I actually do have a hard stop. And if we are um, going to be deliberating still for a while, I wanted to know whether or not I could um, abstain from this particular vote and if we could appoint one of the uh, uh, one of the other folks up. Do you have another two minutes? I do, yes. Okay. Any further comment from the board? I'll entertain a motion. I, I 
I will make a motion that we grant the um, relief requested and that we use the submitted material as our finding of fact. I second it. The only additional comment is I'm, I'm, my primary concern was the hardship and I'm satisfied with the information that we've received that that criteria is satisfied and on that basis, happy to support the motion. So let's go around the horn. Uh, any further comment on the motion? Okay, Wayne Rosa. Aye. Steve Mignatelli. Aye. Bob Daigle? Aye. James Drago? Aye. Vote aye as well. Variance is granted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, members of the board and Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the attention. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. members of the board, same for me. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, making that a, a prettier place. You're welcome, and and have a good evening. Thank you. Any guys. new or old business? Any new or old business to come before to come before the board at this time? I got one question. Yes. I I haven't received anything from the town. Do I have to do anything for the town? My my term is up. Was up. Do I have to do anything? I've been sworn in or anything. You're. Uh, I would call. I would call the uh, town clerk's office tomorrow. Call, call Terry or uh, Donna tomorrow. Yeah, they said they were just going to kick it down the road a piece when I called them last time. So I, I'm assuming I'm still. I yeah, I think I think you and I are in the same terms, Bob, and I, and I think that we stay until until we're replaced. But I will. I, you know what? I, I will talk to Terry tomorrow, and um, get us get us on the town council agenda if necessary. All right. Very good. I've, I've been functioning new? that no news is good news, sort of. Yeah. Any other new or old business to come before the board at this time? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Okay, James filed the motion. Bob seconded it. Bob Daigle? Bob? Aye. Aye, Aye. or nay? Aye. Steve? Aye. James? Aye. 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 All right. as well. Thank, thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, all. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.